Okay, we have finished chapter 13 of Matthew. We're going to get into chapter 14. Chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 of Matthew are going to detail expectations of the Messiah. Some of these expectations, uh, they're, they're going to detail responses to Christ as well as people's expectations of Christ. Um, they're going to detail these expectations. Um, some of these expectations the, the folks have that we'll, we'll, we'll go through and see this in 14 through 20, for, chapter 14 through chapter 20, um, they're jacked up expectations and none could be even more jacked up than the scribes and Pharisees, the religious elite. Um, but what's interesting, when you look at their expectations, we talk about this all the time, the scribes, Pharisees, the religious elite believed that the Messiah would come and do what? Conquer Rome. Would come in victory. Conquer Rome and the Roman oppressors and deliver the Israelites out from underneath them. And they, where did they get this expectation? Well, they got it from Scripture. They just misunderstood what Scripture was teaching. Psalm 2, Daniel 2 talks about a Messiah who will come in victory. So they're expecting this victorious Messiah. Unfortunately, their interpretation of the Scripture was flawed. Because he came in to conquer sin and death, a greater oppressor. Um, there, the problem, though, was they were not willing to accept the truth. They were not willing to accept that the Messiah is coming and not conquering Rome then. They rejected the truth. They came to it with a heart that was unwilling to receive it and reject it. Unwilling to submit to it and rejected it. Some people's expectations were very similar that they expected the Messiah to come and conquer Rome. But when that was not the case, they did not reject it, but they wanted just to seek the truth. They had a heart to want to know the truth, that their expectations were wrong, what's going on, but then were willing to come and want to know the truth no matter the cost. And John the Baptist is a perfect example of this. Turn with me back to Matthew 11. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 before we look at today's text. John the Baptist is a great example of this. Matthew 11, 1 through 3. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? John the Baptist had the same flawed expectations as the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees would not receive it, the truth. They would not come to the realization that their expectations was wrong, where John the Baptist was willing and was seeking it, because John the Baptist is sitting in jail like, wait a minute, if you're the Messiah and the kingdom of God is in fact at hand, then why am I in prison for preaching the kingdom of God is at hand? What's, something's not right here. So where the scribes and Pharisees were not willing to submit to the truth and know the truth, John the Baptist was willing to receive the truth no matter the cost. And so in today's verses, go back to Matthew 14, we're going to find what the cost was for this dude. And it included his head on a platter. That was the cost. To teach the truth, preach the truth, no matter the cost. Grabbing our, his expectations, aligning his expectations up with a clarity of what the truth of Scripture teaches. So let's go to Matthew 14, 1 through 13. Because what we're going to find in these verses is how um, our sin, our own sin, impacts us to evil. We're going to see examples of this. How others' sin impacts us to evil. And how sin impacts Jesus. Matthew 14, 1 through 13. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch, 
heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother <coughs> Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus... Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. So let's look at verses 1 through 5 again, where we will see how our sin impacts us to evil. An example of this in, in regards to Herod the Tetrarch. 1 through 5 again. By the way, the reason why I read through these scriptures like this again and again is because we have minds that wonder. Like, even up here reading the whole verses 1 through 13, there's a moment in that where my mind was wondering and thinking about other things, but I was even still reading it audibly. So the reason why I go back over and over and over it again is so that we can shorten the, the time and the chance that we're, our minds are wandering away from scripture. So the value in that is reading scripture over and over again. So let's do that again. 1 through 5. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the, the people because they held him to be a prophet. Now, when I was reading these verses for the first time, it took me a while to figure out the, the flow of these events. Because what Matthew does, the Holy Spirit through Matthew, kind of does a literary shuffle here. These, these events are not in chronological order. So verses, um, verses 1 and 2 happened after verses 3 through 13. So look at that. Pay attention to that. He says, at that time, what time? What time is he talking about? The time when Jesus was doing all these many mighty works. Herod hears about these works, and he accredits these works to the dead John the Baptist. Well, wait a minute. John the Baptist is dead? So then Matt, Holy Spirit through Matthew then digresses real quick, and then goes back in time to then detail the account of John the Baptist's death. Do you see that? The literary shuffle that he does? So he's, he's referring to events that have happened prior to this time. So in verses 3 through 13, he digresses and gives a background history of the death of John the Baptist. Now what Herod are we talking about? We are not talking about Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the, mo the man who was killing all the, the, the babies in Jerusalem and of uh, two years old and younger in an attempt to eliminate the Messiah, to kill Christ, when uh, Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt. That's Herod the Great. This is Herod uh, the Tetrarch, which is Herod Antipas, which is Herod the Great's son, one of Herod the Great's son. Now, Herod the Great had many women and had many children to many of these women. Okay, So there were a bunch of um, half-brothers and sisters of Herod the Great. This is Herod um, Antipas. So why did this Herod the Tetrarch, or Herod Antipas, put John in jail? What's the scripture tell us here? For the sake of... No, what's it say? What's the word? Let, 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 let the text tell you the answer. Herodias. For the sake of Herodias. That's why Herod Antipas put 
John in jail. John the Baptist openly spoke out to against Herod Antipas for the sake of Herod Herodias, saying, It is unlawful for you, Herod Antipas, to have Herodias. It's unlawful for you to have her. What does he mean? What we have here is an old-fashioned love triangle that's just nasty. We're talking incest and all kinds of nasty stuff going on. So, Herodias, this woman is wicked. We'll see this in a minute. Okay? Wicked. She was married to Herod Antipas' half-brother, Philip. That's what the text says, right? Philip's wife. So, Herod Antipas had another wife, um, which was a daughter from a king over another area. Herod Antipas went to visit his half-brother, Philip, and then seduced Herodias to leave and divorce his half-brother, Philip. And then Herod Antipas would divorce his wife, and they became then married. They're married at this point in time. Okay? It was nasty. What's even nastier, what makes this even nastier, is that Herodias, who was married to Philip, got divorced, then married Herod Antipas, was also Herod Antipas's niece. Because her dad was the daughter of another half-brother. You guys following me? Okay, so Jerry Springer. <laughs> that set the context. Herod Herodias was married to Philip, which was Herod Antipas's half-brother. Divorced and became married to Herod Antipas. She's the daughter, Her Herodias, of another half-brother of her new husband. Because remember, Herod the Great had a bunch of kids with a bunch of women. So she's the daughter. Uh, she, so essentially, Antipas is his wife's, Herodias, uncle. Make sense? What's John do? Does John just kind of like, sweep that under the rug? No, he boldly proclaimed the truth to him, no matter the cost, that it is unlawful for you to have her. And of course, what's, what, 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 what do sinful, wretched people do? They dismiss the truth to justify their sin. Like, he wants her. He wants her. So there's only one way to justify it. Get rid of the voice. I've got to silence the voice that's telling me that this is unlawful, so I'm going to throw him in jail. John the Baptist was neither a compromiser or a diplomat. He stood firm on the truth, even at the cost of severe persecution. And in this case, it resulted in his head being uh, removed from his body. Um, but also, who, who wrote this gospel? Okay. Who wrote it through Matthew? Okay, the Holy Spirit. Notice how the Holy Spirit even doesn't even address Herodias as Antipas's wife. How does he refer to Herodias here? Philip's wife. They've been divorced and they're remarried, but the Holy Spirit still refers to him, her as Philip's wife because it's unlawful, it's wicked. Even the Holy Spirit through Matthew will not refer to and um, refuses to recognize the marriage, the unlawful marriage. John the Baptist, man, he was willing to confront sin in truth regardless of the consequence. He was not a compromiser or a diplomat. So again, what's the his so um, Herod Antipas's sin? How his own sin impacted him for, to evil? He has to eliminate the voice that's speaking truth to him, so he sends him to jail. Got it? Now let's bring in this Herodias and see how her sinful wickedness impacts her daughter and her husband Antip Herod Antipas to evil. Okay, impacts them to engage in evil. That's what we see in 6 through 11. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. 
Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Let's set the stage. Birthdays. That's what we're talking about, right? It's Herod's birthday. Birthday parties, back then, are similar to stags today. Bachelor parties, stags, like that kind of, like the world kind of bachelor parties, those kinds of stags, wretchedness. Um, where only men were invited. They would get drunk, and they would eat food. They would be filled to the gills, and then they would have women come in and dance seductively, and then that would eventually turn into a huge orgy. That's the context of what's going on here. So Herod Antipas is drunk, stuffed, and being seductively danced to by who? his stepdaughter, and others. Okay? So that's the, the context here. So Herodias, who is the New Testament version of Jezebel, wicked, knows what's going on. She knows, she hates John the Baptist because he is, again, he is, he is adamantly standing on truth and speaking against this. So Herodias' wickedness, she sees the opportunity, her drunk husband, and then this daughter of hers. And it, 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 it causes her, it impacts um, the situation. Her wretchedness, her own sin impacts then having her, her husband and her daughter be accomplices in the murder of a man whom Jesus said in Matthew 11, out of those born of women, no one was greater. And what he means by that, out of those born of women, it's out of those born in iniquity with a sinful nature. Okay? John the Baptist was a sinner and still needed to be converted and redeemed because he was, he was not God. Only Christ was the sinless one. But he is saying, Jesus said that this was one that was greater than, was greater than everybody. So that's the wretchedness that was operating in Herodias, right? So a couple of things I want you to see in this text. Um, the, the immediacy of this. Verse 7. No, verse 8. Prompted by her mother. Because Herod made the promise, whatever you want, because he wanted her, whatever you want, I'll give you. He's drunk, full, stuffed, living just uh, wicked. <coughs> Prompted by her mother, she says, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. Why so immediate? Why, so, why is it here, immediate? Because he's drunk. He just made a proclamation, a promise, in front of all of these other men. I'll give you whatever you want. And Herodias knows that when this guy sobers up, he might be backing out of this promise. And so he makes this stupid promise, drunk in front of all these men, and now he's keeping his promise because the text says that he's sorry. But we're, we're, there's two different kinds of sorry. And Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly grief, godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief, worldly sorrow produces death. That's clearly the sorrow that he has here. So, he, so, so uh, Herod Antipas makes this proclamation and this promise, drunk, wasted, with all these men, and he's trying, he, he, he makes this promise and now pride's operating in him. He can't back away from this promise after making it so clear with all these men, he goes through with it. So the sorrow that the text says that he has is not repentant sorrow. It's worldly sorrow. We know the difference. Amen? So he goes through with it, right? He goes through. And so Herodias knows it's got to happen now because he's drunk. He's in this situation with all these men are looking at him. And so he can't back out. And so it happens immediately on a platter right now. 
So that thing happened very quick. So then, John the Baptist, that's the end of John the Baptist, right? Head severed and brought to him on a platter. In the, in the, in the face of being killed and upsetting, it's like, think about like, that culture still hasn't changed, especially in that kind of environment over, over in like the Middle East where you have people in authority, kings and stuff that, that still do these things. And they're like coming to these current kings and saying, you can't, that's not okay. That's unlawful for you to have, the same thing would be happening now. But John the Baptist stayed true to his purpose. What was his purpose? What, what, what was his message to proclaim? Matthew 3, 2 tells us that. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He stayed true to the purpose of why God created him, which was to proclaim repentance. He did it no matter the cost. And for him, the cost was his head. His mission um, was rem he remained faithful to his mission even to the point of death. I love it. Very encouraged by it. Verses 12 and 13. How sin impacts Jesus. And let me make sure that I'm, before I start, I'm not saying, like, I'm saying the impact that we're going to see, it, sin doesn't impact him to the point where, like, he's sinning. That's not what I'm saying. He's, he, 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 he's, he, he weeps over it. I, I believe he's, he's broken over it because he knows the reality of, of those who will not come to repentance and will not be saved and what happens, what will happen for, to them in eternity. Like, there's, and, and we should have a heart of that same kind of sorrow, if you will, um, over sin. Verse 12, And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. Whose disciples came? John the Baptist's disciples came. They took the body of John the Baptist and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Before I go to 13, could you imagine being a disciple of John the Baptist and having to do that? His head was not on his body. So his disciples, who had spent years with him, and hearing him preach, and uh, seeing him stand firm and boldly proclaim truth, no matter the, the, the cost, has to carry his body that does not have a head to bury it. The despair and sorrow that they had must have felt breaks my heart. And it's worthy to mention right now. Now when Jesus heard of this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. So when I look at verse 13, and I, I, when, when, when you come to a passage like this, and, and, and you're, you're looking at the context in the passage and, and how it relates to the previous verses and the, and the, and the verses after it, because that's what you're supposed to do. When you come to the scripture, that's what you're supposed to see, to identify context. I, I had a hard time with if, if 13 refers to to this incident or if has Matthew then hit the reset button fast forward button and brought us back up to the current time pay attention guys this is this is really how can I say um, strategic really focused study of God's Word is 13 because think about the flow of Matthew's gospel math at the end of Matthew 13 into Matthew 14 at that time Herod the tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus and he said to his servants this is John the Baptist he has been raised from the dead that is why these miraculous powers are work at him that's current time Matthew then digresses and goes back to previous time so the question of verse 13 is, Matthew talking about events that happened back here, or has Matthew reset us back to the current time? You guys following me? And I can't say with 100% certainty which one it is. If I had to take a guess, I would say he's still talking about when Jesus had initially heard of John the Baptist's death. Um, and that's why he went away. But then if you get into then the end of verse 13, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on from foot. And then into 14, he says, uh, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd because he was in a boat. And then he kind of goes on. So there's, there's a little confusion there for me as to what events are. 
So I am more confident in saying, but not 100% confident, that this verse is referring back to when Jesus initially heard about John the Baptist's death. He went away to a place by himself on a boat. And if that is in fact the case, I can see him weeping. I can see him with a heart, not just a heart of sorrow and weeping for John the Baptist who was murdered, but also for the wretchedness of those that were involved and the eternal reality of where they're going to be staying separated from everything that is good. Amen? So then I see how sin then impacts Jesus in this and that it breaks his heart. We see a God who, and, and, and if that's true, then we'll see that over Scripture. And we do. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And when he's crying out, oh, Jerusalem, and he says it twice, there's, 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 a, there's a heart of love and of, of like, oh, why? I just wanted to gather you like, like a hen gathers his chicks, but you were unwilling. You kept wanting to leave. And at a certain point, there is no more gathering. That's a heart that's crying out to, to those, come to me, come. Where you're going, it is unfulfilling. It, it, it's not going to give you what it promises to give you. And so I see then how that uh, sin, if in fact this verse refers to the context of the, detail, the events in the past, then uh, we see how sin impacts Jesus. Amen? Read it one more time. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Think about this. He had, he sobers up. So he's drunk. He had John the Baptist killed. He sobers up and he goes, Oh, crap. Now I'm haunted. And we know people, and we've heard stories of people who have murdered people, and they, for the rest of their life, they're haunted by that. The, this, the, and believe, you know, that the spirit of the person that they murdered are coming after them, and they live in fear. That's the first person he thinks of when he sees Jesus doing these miracles, is the one that he had murdered. Panicked, freaked out, scared, tortured. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Repent. Turn from this. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, a time of debauchery, wretchedness, drunken and... and, and gluttonous the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod seductively pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask even in Mark's account I think he talks about even half of his kingdom that's how, like, twisted, and that's how powerful he was seduced, and how badly he lusted over her. All drunk. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and his guest pride, weak man trying to be strong, trying to appear strong to the other people around him by keeping his oath, shows you how weak he is. His guest, he commanded it to be given, and he sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Let's pray. Lord, I give you praise for the boldness of John the Baptist. If we could be so bold, um, to be so fearless in the face of certain death, to proclaim repentance, to proclaim the truth of who you are, 
Uh, Lord, we give you uh, glory for those children of yours, our brothers and sisters who, like John, did that and who are currently facing persecution, uh, no matter the degree, but specifically those who met their death because of it. Lord, we give you praise for your faithfulness in and through them. Uh, Lord, we look forward to meeting them in heaven. Um, Lord, and uh, let that be true for us, that we are willing to receive that persecution um, from the world, Lord, no matter the cost. We love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.